Ladies and gentlemen, it's a few minutes past the hour. So in the interest of time, I think we'll start this webinar. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Jarker Tamelander. I'm the Director of Science and Policy at the Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Um, it's my pleasure to be moderating this uh, uh, webinar uh, from theory to practice, how the benefit accounting of nature-based solutions methods align with real-world projects. Um, I'll give a very brief uh, introduction to this webinar before we get down to the actual agenda. Um, first of all, I think, as we all know, wetlands are a very vital component of watersheds. They're an important source of fresh water. They store water, act as natural filters, cleaning water. Uh, they're an ally in addressing global challenges such as climate change. Uh, many wetlands, including mangroves, seagrasses, peatlands, they absorb carbon emissions, they store vast amounts in biomass and in soil uh, and can help buffer climate change. Mangroves also act as natural barriers protecting coastal communities from flooding and disasters and so on. At the same time, 90% um, of the world's wetlands have been degraded since uh, industrialization set in and wetlands continue to disappear at a rate the three times faster than uh, most terrestrial systems, including forests. It's uh, out of that that the Convention on Wetlands was developed. Uh, this is an intergovernmental treaty that provides the framework for national action and international cooperation for the conservation and wise use of wetlands and their resources. This year, in 2021, uh, the Ramsar Convention celebrates 50 years since it was signed into treaty. To date, uh, 171 countries have ratified the treaty and committed to conservation of wetlands, with over 2,400 wetland sites on the list of wetlands of international importance. The Convention has also recognized, uh, the parties to the Convention have recognized uh, that the private sector and business entities have a very important role to play and are indeed an important ally to achieve sustainability. Uh, based on the multiple services and benefits uh, that wetlands provide. In, um, in 1998, the Convention on Wetlands and Danone signed what, uh, what can be seen as quite a pioneering partnership uh, on, uh, between the Convention and a private entity for the mutually beneficial agenda to enhance global recognition of wetlands. And it's in the context of that partnership that we're very, very happy to sponsor today's webinar. Measuring wetland values is clearly an important element in accelerating action on wetland protection and using wetlands to drive sustainable development. Um, by offering standardized, a standardized approach to account for the multiple benefits such as carbon, water, biodiversity, and so on, the methodology that you'll learn about here can help cement watersheds as a valuable nature-based solution for development of countries, but also for the development and sustainability of individual businesses as well as uh, uh, other entities. So this really is a key tool to pave the way for increased private sector investment in and business engagement in nature conservation. And uh, we very much look forward to hearing more about this methodology and hearing some discussion around uh, how it can be applied by uh, representatives of the business community. So with that, with those few um, opening remarks, I would like to introduce to you the three speakers in this webinar who will uh, uh, give us an overview of, of this method and, uh, and uh, then set the stage for a panel discussion a little bit later on. Uh, so first of all, I'm very happy to introduce uh, uh, Cora Kammeyer, uh, Senior Researcher at the Pacific Institute, where she works on corporate water stewardship, integrated water management and uh, water policy. Uh, we also have uh, Michael Matosic, uh, who is um, a corporate strategy associate focusing on global water security for the Nature Conservancy. And he engages with the Nature Conservancy's corporate partners around source water protection in key geographies and also helps refine uh, uh, the Nature Conservancy's corporate strategy. 
And last certainly not least, Emma Riley, who recently joined the Nature Conservancy as a benefit accounting of nature-based solutions for watersheds intern. And Emma holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the Columbia University. So they will take us through the methodology within this webinar. And as I mentioned later on, we'll get into a discussion on its applicability to practitioners, to companies. And uh, hopefully we'll have a, a really good discussion around this method. So with that, uh, again, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, we look forward to active discussion and I pass the floor to our first speaker. Cora, please go ahead. Thank you, Erica. So I will give a, a brief background around nature-based solutions and this project, and then I'll hand it off to Michael and Emma to talk about a synthesis that they've been doing, comparing our MBS method to real world projects, and then we'll turn to our panelists. Um, so as background, I just wanted to get everyone on the same page. What are nature-based solutions? And we'll be calling them NBS as the acronym throughout this presentation. So NBS refer to the effective restoration, adaptive management, and sustainable use of nature for tackling environmental, social, and economic challenges. What you see on the slide is the most commonly accepted definition of NBS from IUCN. The challenges that NBS can help address include things like climate change, water insecurity, water, air, and soil pollution, decreasing biodiversity, food insecurity, lack of economic opportunity, and public health and disaster risks. Many of these challenges are at the top of the agenda for governments, NGOs, businesses, and civil society around the world. Next slide. MBS have the potential to deliver sustainable improvements in watershed health with multiple benefits, but there are several barriers that are limiting widespread implementation of MBS. And you can see some of those listed here on the slide. While all of these are important, this project aims to tackle the last point on this list, which is a lack of a standardized approach to identify and account for the benefits accrued from investments in MBS. By addressing this barrier, as well as speaking to some of the others on this list, we're helping to build the business case for investments in MBS. Next slide. So the aim of this project is to develop a standardized method, guide, and tool to account for the stacked water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomic benefits of MBS for watersheds. There are four key components of this project that I'm gonna walk through now. The first was a landscape assessment, which informed the path to this project. This was published last summer, and it explores the concept, definitions, and classifications of MBS, it identifies opportunities and barriers to scaling NBS, and it reviews available frameworks and methods for evaluating, measuring, and demonstrating the value of NBS investments. The method that we developed, the second piece, is a stepwise process which can support the identification of the stacked water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomic benefits of NBS. Our recently published guide presents practical guidance on how to use the method to identify MBS benefits, and we indicate where data should be collected along various phases of projects, and we provide relevant and robust indicators and calculation methods to help estimate and measure benefits. In this guide, we also present a synthesis of global case studies of corporate investments in MBS and provide best practice approaches for MBS implementation. Finally, the fourth piece of this project is the tool, which is currently under development. This is going to be a user-friendly platform based on the method and the guidance, which can support benefit identification and accounting. This will offer practitioners a simple way to identify activities, natural processes, benefits, and trade-offs from MBS investments across multiple habitats anywhere in the world, as well as offer practical guidance on appropriate indicators and calculation methods to measure or estimate quantitative and qualitative benefits. The primary audience for this work is private sector decision makers, and it's especially useful for companies that are implementing or considering investing in NBS and would like to estimate and demonstrate the benefits of NBS interventions. But these resources can also be helpful to the public sector, NGOs, and community stakeholders who are interested in advancing NBS. To close out this short introduction, I just wanna emphasize that there is no one size fits all solution or approach to MBS. And we always need to consider local context, social and environmental issues and opportunities, 
and other factors to ensure that these projects are successes. Our method and guide and the other outcomes of this project are a great starting point for those who are looking to build a robust business case for MBS. And with that, I will hand it off to Michael. Great, thank you, Cora. Um, so once we completed the guide that Cora just mentioned, we want to make sure the guide was applicable to the target audience. So to test its applicability, we conducted a pilot survey of companies, NGOs, and government agencies who have or who are currently conducting MBS projects to see how the method and the guide aligns with actual case studies. So we hope that the pilot survey would check six boxes. The first is global applicability. We were hoping to check that the method we developed and presented in the guide is robust and defensible across multiple habitats, interventions, and geographies. The second is around alignment. We want to check that the steps we have developed align with what actual MBS projects have followed in practice. And then the third and fourth checkboxes are about the guide reflecting actual MBS projects. So first we want to ensure that we included all of the necessary activities, processes, and benefits that were identified on the ground. And then we wanted to determine how actual projects identified and later estimated or measured benefits. The fifth checkbox is around stakeholder engagement. Uh, basically, we want to understand the level of stakeholder engagement along the various project phases. And lastly, uh, we wanted, we were interested in identifying key lessons learned uh, to understand the gaps and opportunities moving forward. So a few overview points regarding the survey. Um, first, looking at habitat focus, we prioritized projects that took place in wetland or forest habitats so that we would receive feedback for both terrestrial and aquatic habitats. Looking at the cost of the selected NBS projects, the range was from 20,000 uh, to projected figures of 40 million. And the cost of the um, project depended on the habitat type, activities undertaken, and the scale and duration of the project. However, regardless of the cost, uh, none of the projects stated that the costs outweighed the benefits. The primary challenge that the majority of projects focused on was water related, um, including surface and groundwater quality and quantity. Then looking at the duration of projects, uh, some projects are relatively new, having been implemented just two years ago, while others have been in operation for close to two decades. On average, the projects have been running for seven and a half years. I'd like to thank all of the survey respondents who you see here on the slide um, for participating in the survey and for providing very valuable feedback. Um, as you can see, participants come from a wide variety of sectors and industries, which help provide feedback from very different perspectives. And here you can see the geographic spread of the pilot projects involved in our survey. Um, we aimed to get participants from different locations to ensure our methodology is globally applicable. And now I will pass it to Emma Riley, who will talk more about the habitat types you see here, and we'll dig into the other survey results. Okay, hey, great. Thank you, Michael. So our method compared projects primarily in forest and wetland habitats. And in many cases, the NBS projects were implemented across multiple habitats. So in our pilot survey, most of the projects were equally spread across wetlands and rivers and floodplains. Many of the NBS projects also span agricultural areas. The intervention types used in NBS projects that we reviewed are listed on the right. The majority of projects aim to restore watersheds, nearly 40% of the respondents, followed closely by management of these landscapes. Fewer projects undertook conservation or creation of habitats. So almost all of the projects we reviewed planted, restored, or maintained native vegetation, avoiding or limiting habitat conversion, restoring and improving soil health, as well as reestablishing the hydraulic connection was also ranked highly. And these activities are all directly influenced by the forest and wetland habitats, habitats in which they are being undertaken. And this will change across different habitats. So in total, 18 different activities were considered by these projects. And the method we've developed presents 21 activities, which can be considered when designing and implementing NBS projects. So the processes which were influenced by 
activities differed across the various projects based on the habitat types. Most projects recognize the impact on water filtration and habitat provision, water infiltration and retention, regulation of local hydrology, growth of biomass, carbon take and flood water storage were reported by the majority of those who completed the questionnaires. And 17 of the 19 processes in the guide were accounted for in the survey. So in the questionnaire, primary NBS benefits were categorized across five themes, water quantity, water quality, carbon, biodiversity, and the environment, and socioeconomics. For water quantity, there was an almost equal spread between the various benefits under this theme and the most reported benefit related to an improved or maintained flow regime. And under water quality benefits, improved surface water quality was reported more than groundwater quality by those who completed the survey. For carbon benefits, there were more case studies which reported improved or maintained carbon sequestration rather than reduced carbon emissions. The benefits relating to the abundance and diversity of native and animal species ranked highest among the biodiversity and environment benefits. And interestingly, more real-world case studies reported terrestrial habitat availability and quality, as well as habitat connectivity than for aquatic habitats. Support for local pollinators, pollinators was mentioned by just over half of the respondents, and natural pest control benefits were mentioned by just a few of the survey takers. For socioeconomic benefits, improved or maintained recreation and tourism opportunities was reported by most of the case studies reviewed and improvements to livelihoods and addressing climate adaptation and mitigation also ranked highly. So although food security did not rank as high as other socioeconomic benefits, this may be because agricultural NBS projects were not the focus of this review, but it's clear that a broad spectrum of socioeconomic benefits have accrued across NBS projects. It's also important to consider trade-offs through all phases of NBS projects and about 70% of respondents reported that they acknowledge, measured, or mitigated trade-offs. So one takeaway from our pilot survey was the differences in benefits identified versus benefits actually measured or estimated. And we saw across the board, fewer benefits were actually measured or estimated. And the biggest discrepancy we saw benefits identified versus measured or estimated was under the socioeconomic category. So here for recreation and tourism, livelihood opportunities, climate adaptation and mitigation, education and scientific study, microclimate regulation and human health. Um, here we can see that many socioeconomic benefits were identified, but few were measured or estimated. And this could be for a variety of reasons. This gap could possibly be from a lack of stakeholder engagement or a lack of resources, or that respondents in this survey were focusing on biodiversity, but not on the co-benefits from implementing NBS projects. So our method addresses this gap and we'll be able to measure the benefits across a variety of themes. So finally, the guide has published a series of lessons learned and best practices from almost 100 NBS case studies. And these lessons learned and best practices will support those looking to invest in NBS by giving good advice and alerting them to possible pitfalls so as to avoid them. This survey also asked for lessons learned to ascertain if similar issues and opportunities are rising across other projects. And from the list presented here, the first three items, namely the importance of engaging stakeholders, increasing and communication of habitats to them at every step of the project and capturing the full array of benefits for scaling echo what was said in the guide. And of the lessons learned captured in our pilot survey, these last four points are specifically addressed in our method. So our method measures a variety of benefits across the themes of water quality and quantity, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomics. There's also a huge challenge in collecting baseline data. So the standardized approach can strengthen comparability between companies. So as more companies use our methodology, it would make this benchmarking across projects easier. And we indicate when data should be collected along the various project phases and provide relevant and robust indicators and calculation methods to estimate and measure benefits. Our method tool will create a user-friendly approach to identifying linkages between activities, processes, and benefits across a variety of habitats and interventions. And finally, as Cora actually mentioned, in the introduction, there is no one size fits all approach to NBS. Um, so NBS methods vary greatly and we need to consider local context, social environmental issues and opportunities and other factors to ensure that the project is a success. And from the questionnaires, overwhelmingly the responses were yes, 
when asked whether benefit estimation and valuation would help future decision making. Next slide. So finally, the final webinar in this three-part series will be the official launch for the NBS tool. And our tool is the final output from this stage of the project and will offer practitioners with an intuitive platform to identify and account benefits of NBS investments. So this tool aims to support the business case for NBS and bolster scaling of NBS investments globally. So keep an eye out for the new news of the tool release and the third webinar event in the coming weeks. We'd like to once again acknowledge Ramzar for supporting this project and this webinar series in particular. And that concludes our analysis of the pilot survey results. So with that, we can move on to our panelist discussion where our guests will answer questions about the projects they were involved in. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, to all three presenters for this overview and, uh, and um, big volume of work obviously very good to look at the experiences that are out there uh, try to pinpoint a few of the challenges and make sure that uh, methodological responses actually respond to the uh, to the real needs uh, and uh, and the situation that uh, different entities are facing and i think that's uh, some of the things that we want to start discussing in this uh, in this panel so without further ado i'd like to introduce uh, the panelists very briefly to everyone um very happy to have with us uh, jan fabre uh, who's been working in bridging public and private sector interests for over 12 years uh, experience includes development developing uh, projects uh, driven uh, with collective action at a landscape scale and designing strategies aimed at unlocking opportunities for blended finance. And this is, of course, with uh, uh, firmly with, uh, with the Danone um, uh, Water Stewardship Initiative. We also have Emilia Tenuta, Senior Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer at Ecolab. Um, Emilia has had a 36-year uh, tenure at Ecolab, including 25 years uh, of technical and marketing management experience. And in the past 11 years, he's led Ecolab's strategic sustainability journey, journey focused on corporate responsibility, internal environmental stewardship, and helping customers operate more sustainably. And uh, um, our third panelist is uh, Todd Bridges, who is the US Army Senior Research Scientist for Environmental Science. Uh, he leads research and technology application in the areas of sustainable infrastructure and environmental management for the US Army and the Army Corps of Engineers. So uh, welcome to this uh, panel discussion. Thank you all for being here. Now, um, we have a few a few questions to you uh, that we hope um, uh, you can um, discuss. We have uh, relatively ample time, but nonetheless, I ask you to keep uh, responses somewhat uh, succinct and to the point. And maybe I can ask several of you to speak on the same question, so we get different perspectives uh, on on each of these uh, uh, questions. Now, without any further ado, Jian, maybe I can turn first to you. Um, as we are estimating benefits, are we really capturing what's most important or what's easiest to estimate? Uh, are there any additional benefits beyond what you've already done that you would have wanted to look at, estimate or measure, um, but you've not been able to? And what are the key barriers that you've faced? Hi, everyone. Um, I think that... Um, most of the companies today are looking to um, monitor the impact of their actions. And those actions are mostly uh, delivering impacts around water, carbon, and biodiversity. So what the tool is allowing to do to proactively uh, assess is greatly aligned with what companies today are looking to assess. Having said that, uh, Economic benefits, I would say, are very important as well to uh, look at. Um, I think it's important to have in mind that be uh, against the perception maybe many have that uh, investing in NBS is more cost costly and requires longer turners. Uh, 
I believe that investing in nature actually is uh, inv investing in an asset that appreciates over time and not depreciate itself. And so I think that it's very important that we look as well at costing the economic benefits of NBS, along with uh, looking at uh, the multiple benefits they bring, uh, the one I just said, water, carbon, and biodiversity. Uh, thank you. Uh, really interesting point. And I think um, we could uh, easily turn the same question to others. So, so if I may, Emilio and Todd, do you have further reflections on this same question? Uh, what are the key benefits that you'd need to measure and what have been the stumbling blocks in, in measuring them in the past? Yeah, so I can, I, I'll, I'll start. This is Emilio. Thanks for having me again, Jurker. And I, I, I just want to make sure that from a context perspective, there's obviously a lot of things that we can look at, um, you know, but I think it's important to understand the strategy from where a company's coming from when you look at the nature-based solution. And for Ecolab, where, you know, um, core to our purpose is protecting people and vital resources. We're based in Minnesota, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we have partnered with uh, the Nature Conservancy for decades now, uh, along with other resource partners. And I think to answer your question, I, you know, taking um, action around projects and really identifying those benefits that align with that strategy. You know, we partnered with TNC on two important fund, water fund projects that uh, go along the Mississippi River watershed uh, basin from the headwater fund at the beginning of, the, of the, the Mississippi River that really focused on forest protection uh, in Minnesota, in the headwaters. Uh, and then if you go 2000 river miles down, we're in the Gulf region where we have operations there. And in that uh, location, it's very different where we actually look at projects that uh, restore floodwater uh, balance as well as wildlife and other, other uh, ecosystem benefits. And so for us, it's very, you know, you know, there's there's easy things that you can look at, uh, you know, benefits to measure, which includes things like acreage and water flows and number number of species, right? But then there's harder things to measure that are downstream impacts, like water quality improvements and reduced flooding events. Those things are very difficult, and it takes time to observe and document these benefits, and so it's hard to link these benefits to to our work versus others. So we definitely need to try, um, but we need to keep in mind that the big picture is around catalyzing these funds to reduce impairments in the water basin. Thanks, Emilia. Actually, can I prod you for a little bit of follow-up there because you touched on something very interesting. Is this concept of investment in a nature-based solution arising in a certain location, whereas benefits may accrue in many different locations. And so how have you been able to handle that aspect? Well, I mean, I think we, we um, from a corporate water strategy perspective, is really going through that risk assessment and really understanding the shared water challenges in our at-risk locations. And we did that with the Headwater Fund, as an example, in Minnesota. We also then saw the same opportunity at a one of our large manufacturing facilities down in Louisiana that looked at this TNC project called Lock Clevin. And so understanding, you know, the implications of those shared water challenges and really identifying the right project that really aligns with what we can contribute to supporting that shared water challenge is important to our strategy on what we'll invest in and what benefits we're looking to get out of it. Great, uh, thank you. Todd, can I turn this same question to you in a slightly different way? How has the US Army Corps of Engineers looked at nature-based solutions? And in this context, how do you choose which, how do you decide which benefits to estimate? Yeah, uh, we've, we've had a focus on nature-based solutions uh, going back to 2010 when we started our engineering with nature initiative. I mean, there are many examples of the Corps of Engineers as a public agency developing what we now call nature-based solutions that go back decades. 
But over the last 10 or 11 years, we've been trying to elevate that practice. And in order to make even further advancements in the use of nature-based solutions. And there are two elements to this. There's a policy element to this, and there's a technical or methodological element to this. Um, and public agencies and private companies both have policy. They're formed in different ways, of course, but they both have policy. And policy within government sets priorities. You know, it puts focus on particular subsets of benefits. And of course, that policy can evolve over time. It maybe evolves more slowly than our capacity to actually measure things, which I think is probably one of the challenges in the, in the public sector. Um, on the technical side, I would say, you know, there are almost an endless number of controversies about what methods may be preferred over other methods, for example. And do we have to monetize everything? Uh, that we're actually going to be considering as a part of decision making? Or might we allow for non-monetized benefits, let's say like social equity, or to address vulnerabilities in certain portions of the population, which may be more difficult to monetize in a strict sense? So there's really a, a range of, I think, challenges that that uh, we face with respect to nature-based solutions, I think in the public sector and private sector, but it's really a combination of these two major elements. There's the policy and then the matched technical or methodological approaches to address the policy. Um, thank you. And, uh, on that very point, um, I think I'm getting a strong echo of my own voice. <laughs> uh, on that very point, where, there is a need to consider both financial economic benefits as well as then benefits that you may measure in different currency, non-monetary measurements. How have you how have you combined them or how have you made a decision on when to use which kind of uh, uh, value basis or value statement? Well, in in our work, it's going to be driven by, in some cases, the type of project, for example, certain approaches would apply if the main function of a project is flood risk management protection versus a project that is identified as having a main function that is ecosystem restoration. You know, so there are different you know, policies and procedures that govern those domains. So one of the challenges I think for public agencies around the world is, well, and, and is particularly true for nature-based solutions, well, we should be able to address all of those at the same time, right? Not try to segregate them into different types of projects, but how can we combine nature and engineering to fulfill a broader spectrum of benefits? So that's, that is also a policy challenge. Instead of creating these somewhat artificial buckets of projects by type, you know, how can we address the broad spectrum of benefits by combining the natural and the engineered together? So my answer to your question is it kind of depends on the context of the project. <laughs> But on a particular point, I think that's relevant here is that project teams, whether they're in the private sector or they're in the public sector, they only have a certain amount of time or a certain amount of effort that they're going to be able to devote to evaluating benefits. They can't measure a thousand things. I don't think they can even measure a hundred things, right? They're probably going to have to measure a few and the few will depend. And somebody has to select or some body or some policy has to direct the selection of those few. And that is its own you know, challenge, I suppose, for the community as a whole. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. That last point is very interesting. Indeed, uh, uh, selecting what to measure is already a, a statement of, uh, of how value will be expressed or whose value we actually consider in any given context and uh, that's the nature of things it's obviously something that's crucial to bear in mind and perhaps it's something that can go back to our colleagues from TNC if, if they wanted to add something on that very topic but maybe we'll put that aside for now and uh, uh, what you have just shared recently will uh, take us into the next question uh, or the next area of discussion. So I'll ask a, um, a general question and then try to delve into that in a little bit uh, more detail with your help. Um, and the, the main question is this, 
some organizations, uh, some businesses, many businesses, um, they report significant barriers to investing in nature-based solutions. And I think some of you made reference to this. Um, what solutions to those are there to those barriers? I think, Jian, you, you made some comment about this before. Can you speak more specifically to this point of overcoming barriers, uh, including this issue of a belief that it's more expensive or less profitable to invest in nature? Uh, yes, so uh, I don't know if uh, some of you have read recently a CDP report uh, that actually said that um, if you cost uh, inactions versus the cost of actions, actually the cost of inactions will be five times higher than the cost of action. And I think it's even more true for NBS, as I just said before, because it's generated value for people and, and planet. So it's very crucial that we make all an effort, an effort in highlighting better uh, those cost, the cost of actions versus the cost of inaction for to, to trigger more investment um, from the private sector into those specific solutions. I think one barrier as well to overcome is to account the uh, better the impact of the of NBS activities. Uh, when Danon started this coalition almost two years and a half ago, um, it came really from a simple thing. We wanted to have investment from for a specific project. And all the investors we were coming to were telling us, yeah, that sounds like a great project. I want to become more green. I want a greener portfolio, but I don't understand the impact of your project at all. So it came, it came very obvious that we needed to account very much better the impact of the NBS. And this is exactly what the tool is gonna help us out. And, and to do that proactively, it's even better for decision making uh, a person like me at Danone to proactively know better in advance uh, which benefits I'm going to get from which project. So uh, that's the great thing this tool is going to bring. Another thing is uh, business cases. We need much more proof prints. So I guess that the, the, the case studies that have been done will be super helpful and we need to be vocal and help to disseminations of those uh, to make sure that people learn from those business cases and can replicate them. That's super, super key. Um, and the last one for me will be, I think one of, one of the barriers to investment is we need to, uh, all the companies here and international organizations, NGOs working to pledge for the use of NBS to understand and define better what are the criteria for investment from the investors. We need to, together as a community to try to help projects carrier to define better the the, the criteria and to do the same with the financers, uh, the, the, the one that finance projects to, uh, to ask them to define better criteria. This way we can understand each other better. The translations is happening and then we can uh, directly have uh, uh, more investment into those, the projects. Thank you so much and many different threads that I'm very keen to pick up on in your answer and I will try to come back to several of them. But before I do, Emilio, the same question posed to you. Uh, what are your reflections? Wow, so so much is going through my head and I think um, you just heard both panelists talk about some things that really resonate for me. One is that some of the challenges that we see as barriers to making the, the business case for NBS and investing in NBS by companies is some of the things that we heard of, which is, there are tangible and intangible benefits that we can get from these projects. And Todd mentioned the policy and the more ecosystem technical benefits that you can quantify. Some of them are, some of them are difficult to quantify. But I think one of the things that we have to realize is that when you tether something to the strategy from a water strategy, and even better yet, the business strategy for the organization that, that hits on the corporate responsibility work that, that is going on with the organization to really drive you know, the kind of uh, impact that the organization wants to have as it relates to water you know, and environmental justice and some of these other topics that are really resonating today. This is very important, I think, in terms of being able to really uh, align leadership from the top down to understand why a site location needs to focus on biodiversity, nutrification, you know, improvements in 
uh, saltwater intrusion if you're working on a coastal region because of the factors that we just heard about from CDP that you know being proactive on these projects will only benefit us in the long run versus the reactionary approach that we've taken up to date. Thank you. And, and um, Todd, I will actually pose the same question to you, but uh, from a slightly different perspective. Maybe we've heard from a private sector angle uh, about some of the issues that need to be considered, some of the things that drive decision making. In a government policy context, uh, what are your reflections? Well, they're similar, I think, to, yeah. to the private sector. Uh, uh, maybe I'll put the stress point on what I sometimes call the you word, and that word's uncertainties. And there are a range of, of sources of uncertainty that, that I hear about a lot and that we engage in. You know, how do you engineer a nature-based solution? How do you construct a nature-based solution? What are the long-term operational or maintenance costs into the future of a nature-based solution? And, and these, these questions um, pose you know, challenges because to some degree, I think we probably all recognize that implementing nature-based solutions requires a commitment to innovation. And, and we're doing something new. And maybe an organization or a company is doing something for the first time, it's unfamiliar territory, and it requires a commitment to innovation. And innovation necessarily involves the acceptance or tolerance to risks. Um, and, and that has to be compensated. You know, if you're gonna accept the risk, you're accepting the risk because there's some compensating benefit that you're seeking, which gets us back to the subject here, that the better able we are to describe the benefits, to establish the value case, you know, for an MBS, the, the, the better we are to really judge the and, and support this informed decision about accepting the risks of trying something new. And that's another way of saying it, it gets down to, you know, change, you know, to what degree is the organization uh, and, its, and, and its decision makers accepting this idea that they're, you know, they're willing to participate in change, trying something new, that maybe they haven't tried before. And in this regard, I'll just end by saying that the importance of piloting, you can pick another word if you wish, you know, piloting or demonstrating, making an initial, an initial step forward to NBS, scale it certainly so that you can control your risks or whatever. But I think we can only work our way through these kinds of uncertainties by doing something, by you know, learning through doing, not theorizing in a computer framework or, you know, at a conference table someplace. You have to actually get involved and do it and learn through that process. Jerker, can I just add to that? Please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, look, we see more investment in NBS as we got, I, I, I predict there'll be more investment in NBS if we can improve our ability to quantitatively link financial investments to outcomes. Some of the things that Todd are talking about, ecosystem benefits for, you know, for example, reducing the water treatment costs associated with forest protection and headwaters, like I just described earlier. Reducing the downstream flood damages associated with floodplain restoration. Um, and our ability to communicate these quantified benefits to our stakeholders, which includes social and ecosystem improved impacts, is the key to helping our leaders understand the benefits that we can actually, you know, receive from those type of projects. Thank you. Actually, that last statement, um, I'm going to change the order a little bit. Um, the, the point of, of really identifying these outcomes and establishing value as a key source for of evidence is, is crucial. I wanted to ask you, establishing value to whom? And specifically, how can we make sure that there's sufficient benefit accrual to communities in any given context? Uh, how can we make sure that some critical stakeholder groups really are part of the decision process and in setting the parameters for 
you know, the nature-based solution itself, but also the parameters for how value is measured. And I think this is something that may come out in the method. It's something I'd love to hear your views on. And it's something that I could also invite colleagues from TNC to speak briefly about if it came out in the analysis that they did, that they presented before. So first to panelists, are there any immediate takers on that point? Uh, if not, I'll straight away turn to colleagues at TNC. Okay, Todd, well, go ahead. Well, go ahead. I'll just I'll just say if we could reflect historically from moment to say who made the decisions to make an infrastructure investment, let's say fifty or a hundred years ago. Uh, I'd submit to you that the group that made that decision was a pretty small one uh, historically, even for very large investments. And and I think today. Most of us, I think, would appreciate that we need a more substantive form of engagement with communities so that we understand what these communities who will be receiving this project and will be living and interacting with the project, what kind of benefits are they looking for? What do they value? And how can we integrate that into our decision making? That's a very different model than what was happening in probably countries around the world 100 years ago when some small body got together to decide what to build and what to construct where they just decided right so i i think that's the future here as well that has to be matched by the methodological advancement is a, a, a similar kind of commitment to community engagement so for can i just add an example to that the uh, project that i spoke of down in the, the gulf region the upper mississippi river delta the improved floodwater storage one of the things that would have been very beneficial to us, and this is kind of the afterthought now, right, to, to your point, is having the thought that the, the impact to the, the wildlife and, and, and different species in that work that we did in terms of improved quality could have impacted the community. And we know there's a large contingent there when it comes to fisheries from a social perspective that we didn't consider as part of that strategy. It would have been great to have built that in to Todd's point of, by engaging with the community. And so I'm kind of looking at ourselves to say, how do, we, how do we start there to really begin to collaborate before the project actually takes hold so that we can actually understand how this actually translates to the social benefits that we, we can deliver. Great, um, thank you. Now, Circling back a little bit, um, and let me see if I can find what I scribbled. Yes, this point about understanding the financial dimension or the financing dimension of nature-based solutions. Um, we've heard over the past many years that there's a big volume of financing waiting to be used as long as there are bankable projects. So again, to panelists, do you feel that you're becoming better equipped in putting across bankable projects to investors that are based on nature-based solutions? Uh, do these better accounting methods really speak to this point? And can we now see, can we expect a genuine flow of financing into nature-based solution projects? I'm, I'm not sure that with the, um, please, please go ahead. No, go ahead, Emilio, I can, uh, I, I wanted to, to use an example, but I can go after, after you. Um, so um, I think that investors are indeed looking at, when, you, when we look at bankable solutions, it means that we are looking at projects that deliver environmental and social impacts, but as well economic impacts. That's the definitions of bankability. Um, and I think that if we don't have um, standardized tools that account for those benefits and reassure the investors that the project is going to deliver impacts, those environmental impacts is going to be very complex for us to, to gain tractions. One example I had was in Indonesia and the Passwind project that is one of the case studies in, within this tool where uh, we were able to monetize uh, water benefits because we were able to monitor these benefits specifically uh, locally. So by 
for each cubic meter of water saved, then the farmers got a specific uh, support from the, 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 the city uh, close from, from where they work. So uh, I think this is, uh, this is the, the, the starting point of monetizing and having um, investors uh, financing the project is to be very, very much more equipped in, in accounting those benefits. My, 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 just to build on that, and I totally agree. I think the, the concern that we have with sustainability linked bonds would be that, you know, it's great uh, when you have carbon as a KPI, a target that you're trying to get to net zero. You can actually have defined KPIs where you can measure your year over, you know, milestones. I don't know if we're there with nature based solutions, quite honestly. I'm going to be very provocative here, but, you know, Methodology is one thing, but having the credible accounting that we can actually have third party verification that says, here's certain milestones that we can reach over the next 10 years on a project. I'm not sure that we're there yet. And I think that would uh, make finance and banks very nervous that they don't have an auditable trail to get to those KPIs. Can I ask you, um, uh, Emilio, but all of you, is this partly a matter of scale that sometimes we're talking about smaller interventions where MRV costs simply get astronomically high per unit investment? Or, or is there a, a bigger challenge to that? And certainly uh, we're talking about, about a more complex uh, outcome environment than simply uh, 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 some, financial profit to an individual player or something like this. So, so we have to accept that there's an increased complexity in the model as well. But are we, is it scale that's the main problem or are there other really significant challenges? Well, I would say that scale is important here. And increasingly, this is a focus of discussion that, that we have on nature-based solutions, because I think to have the, the real kind of tangible benefits, let's say in the context of flood risk management that we're seeking, the scale has to be substantive. And when you think that about that, then you're saying, well, we're probably not talking about the, you know, the construction time for this project on the order of what it takes to put a building together over a couple of years. You're probably maybe talking about a decade long commitment or maybe multiple decades to develop a system, a nature-based system or network of nature-based solutions that will provide those benefits. That's a, I mean, from my standpoint, it, a completely different financing or capitalization problem than, hey, we're gonna pay for building X and it's gonna go up in two years. Fair, fair point. And, and uh, at the same time, um, simplifying it a little bit, but I sometimes feel, uh, we're not applying the same standards to, to, to every context or every uh, solution. And so, uh, for example, the time horizons required for many nature-based solutions, we should be quite honest about them. They, they might be significant, but that's part of the benefit. So it's, we have to change our, our angle of entry and, and accept that up, up front. At the same time, most infrastructure decisions, yes, the action of building something might be two to three years, but the investment is made on a, made on a multi-decadal timescale when we talk about uh, infrastructure like collective transport. You know, some, some of the most lasting collective transport decisions, they were made 100 years ago. And, and so maybe we could also draw some of this into the nature-based solutions discussion. We're coming up to the very end here. So um, I'm, I'm sorry to start wrapping up this discussion. I'd love to hear more from all of you. We simply don't have the time. Um, I, I think we've heard a lot of really good things from each of our panelists, and I will simply invite you to give us a few more thoughts, maybe a minute maximum each. And, and the, the question to you is, is really, what are the key takeaway messages for those looking to invest in nature-based solutions but have yet to made a decision, have yet to make an investment. What are the key takeaway messages? They're marching orders, up to you. Uh, starting with you, Jan. 
the key takeaway will be uh, NBS is pushing us to go beyond our production sites and to engage with others at the landscape scale. So uh, we need not to be afraid to engage with others on pre-competitive basis, uh, building alliances that will help us to reach the scale that will actually interest investors because they, they don't invest in small size projects. And the chance we have here is that with this NBAs, we can go beyond, look at the landscape, engage with others, and reach the right scale for investors to be interested in investing in those projects. Thank you. Emilio. Yeah, I mean, from what I from today's conversation, I think seeking opportunities in your local watershed and make the connection to the shared water challenges and the ecosystem services your company relies on. Um, and then I would say work with the reliable partners and consider opportunities to support work that is part of large initiatives and collaborations, uh, working with TNC, Limnotech, Pacific Institute, and others that take a science-based approach to verifying the impacts and benefits. Great, and Todd. I, I'll take maybe a more philosophical position since I'm ending. I, I think all organizations, public or private, should make an effort to change their framework of thinking that that it's not not our approach as humans should not be, you know, how are we going to conquer nature to bring it under the submission of our will and our enterprise, but to view nature as a partner. A partner that we should be working with to deliver solutions for our organizations and for society. And when you start thinking about nature as a partner in your effort, that's a completely different way of thinking about how you invest and, and how you pursue your activities. Uh, thank you. And also a good reminder that this is not a zero sum game. And usually when nature wins, we all end up winning a fair bit too. So thanks for that reminder, Todd. Um, before we close this, I would like to turn back to our three speakers from earlier, our TNC colleagues, uh, uh, Cora, Michael, Emma, is there anything further from your side that you feel should be added at this point? I don't think so, Yorker. Thank you. And thanks to the panelists for a really excellent discussion. I did just have a couple closing um, kind of housekeeping things. Uh, as we mentioned, there will be a third webinar in this three-part series where we'll be talking about the tool, which will be released in the next month or so. Um, to access all of the resources that we've been talking about today, you can go to ceowatermandate.com slash NBS. And I also just wanted to acknowledge that we got a lot of really great questions and comments in the chat and in the Q&A function. We didn't get a chance to address them all today in the webinar, but we will be following up either via email or perhaps with a blog post um, to address some of those issues that you uh, brought up. So thank you for everyone for attending and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, with that, there's very much, uh, um, for me to say no there's not there's very little for me to say uh, except uh, to say thank you so much to presenters thank you very much for the panel to the panelists for uh, insightful comment uh, for uh, for wonderful contributions to this discussion uh, thanks to the audience for the input in the chat that has been monitored and as, as Cora said uh, uh, and TNC will get back to you uh, on those questions and uh, and consider it in in taking work further on the, on the guide. Uh, please do attend the next webinar. Uh, information has been provided here. I'm sure you'll receive it in your inboxes in the very near future. From my side, uh, uh, it's uh, great to see this body of work that is so relevant uh, to the Ramsar Convention. And we hope that webinars like this and the tools when they're made available can also be used by the contracting parties, by different entities across uh, the world to really move forward nature-based solutions and uh, whether it is for the purpose of financing or whether it's simply for a purpose of accounting uh, the, the, the benefits arising, we, we need to get uh, a better grip on how much progress we can make on the basis of, of this. And we certainly look forward to sharing, identifying and sharing solutions and experiences so that uh, more countries and more entities can apply these experiences. So with that, uh, we are already a couple of minutes over time. Um, thank you so much for being with us and I look forward to seeing you all soon.
uh, in a future webinar or other similar efforts. Thanks again to panelists and partners for all their inputs. Bye for now.